Hi everyone, I'm uh, Carlos Muñoz Ferrandis. I'm Tech and Regulatory Affairs Council at uh, Hiking Face. We are an AI focused startup, uh, machine learning platform provider, but also an open source and open science uh, community at uh, large. So nowadays I'm mainly focusing on the intersection between AI governance and more precisely AI uh, upcoming regulations and the role and the impact uh, of those in the open source context or even broader open um, innovation and open uh, licensing uh, communities at large. Prior to, be, um, to being at uh, Hagen Face, I was also involved in other open source related projects. My PhD deals with the intersection between open source and standards from, um, from an IP and competition law perspective, but more focused on the telecommunications and consumer electronics industry. And also, I participated in uh, Big Science. Uh, Big Science was an open, transparent, and collaborative uh, uh, innovation project focused on the development of a large language model, a multilingual mo one trained on 46 uh, different languages uh, called uh, Bloom and uh, promoted, also financed by two uh, public uh, French research agencies, uh, Jean Z and Ancien RS, for the supercompute. So, as you see, uh, I have a strong. Uh, um, feeling about uh, open licensing uh, and uh, open source. I think this is my also daily uh, work and, and motivation. Uh, if you take a look at uh, AI related markets, uh, even as uh, distributed ledger technologies related ones, uh, the main baseline of every single um, of these markets is open source. Uh, so the critical infrastructures are open source. You take a look at, for instance, machine learning frameworks, uh, the most used ones, such as uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, these are open source. Our main transformers or diffusers uh, library at Hugging Face, these are open source. Uh, more specifically, for instance, within Hugging Face, we have um, almost 100,000 uh, public uh, pre trained models uh, released on an open basis. Same as for data sets, we have, I think, nowadays more than 15. Uh, thousand data sets uh, released on an open basis. Um, now the main point that we have realized also coming um, to this debate on the AI Act is that openness nowadays is not enough. We have to start thinking about striking this balance between openness and uh, either responsible use or some upcoming sexual regulations such as the AI Act. Uh, to give you a bit of context, uh, the AI Act, before the AI Act, uh, at the, within the EU, we had back in 2019 um, a set of uh, AI trustworthy ethics guidelines uh, pro, yeah, pro, developed uh, by the high level uh, expert group on AI within the European Commission. And at the same time, this very same year, the OECD uh, published their set of uh, principles relating to trustworthy AI. So in my opinion, uh, prior to these new regulatory proposals, uh, governments and regulators all over the world try to take a more soft law uh, approach by issuing guidelines, recommendations uh, on how to approach the governance of AI to test also with the market actors, with stakeholders, how these uh, were going to, um, let's say, react to this kind of new approach to regulating AI. So this was, let's say, the first uh, step within uh, the regulatory transition to regulate AI. And nowadays, well, to one year ago, back in 2021, April 2021, the European Commission um, publishes uh, the first draft of the proposed AI Act. The main goal of the AI Act is to strike a balance between a pro-innovation approach to artificial intelligence, but also safeguarding consumer safeguards, fundamental rights. Now, how uh, the AI Act uh, tries to strikes, uh, strike this balance, on the one hand, they take, a, as you may know, a high-risk uh, or risk-based approach uh, to the regulation of uh, AI systems. You go from Article 5 to Article 6, and already in Article 5 of uh, the EU AI Act, you have forbidden scenarios where economic actors are not meant to use artificial intelligence for very specific scenarios such as social scoring, for instance. Article 6 then goes a bit farther and uh, tries to specify a set of high-risk scenarios wherein uh, economic actors can develop and use AI systems within these scenarios, however, under intense, uh, let's say, administrative uh, and authority-based scrutiny. 
So notified authorities, national uh, authorities are going to be in charge of uh, assessing whether these AI systems used under these very specific scenarios, such as critical infrastructure, for instance, uh, AI systems devoted uh, to manage an electricity uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure, AI systems uh, put into place within uh, the, let's say, work context, educational systems. Um, all these are going to be under close scrutiny from a national but also EU uh, perspective when it comes to AI-specific authorities assessing the use of these systems. Um, so we have already the 4 billion systems, we have the high-risk AI systems, and then we have two more levels. One specifically devoted to, um, let's say, chatbox or deep face generation and promoting transparency-based requirements for those specific systems under Article 52. And finally, we have the rest. So basically, normal, we could say, AI systems not falling under forbidden uses, high-risk restrictions, or these specific deepfakes uh, generation uh, systems. And for the rest, the Commission takes a more soft law approach under Article 69, promoting uh, for AI communities or the AI value chain at large, the use and design of codes of conduct. So a more, let's say, market-based, the soft law governance approach to the regulation of uh, these uh, more common um, AI systems. That's for the risk-based approach of uh, the Act. Then the Act takes also a different dimension, which is a very interesting one, which is the pro-innovation dimension. The a Act includes, under Article 53, 54, um, AI regulatory sandboxes. Now, regulatory sandboxes are kind of a new uh, regulatory paradigm already pioneered back in 2015 uh, from the British uh, FCA. So they issued the first think tank regulatory sandbox. Now, what's a regulatory sandbox? A regulatory sandbox at the end of the day is just an institutional testing framework wherein both uh, the regulator or the authority and economic stakeholders, for instance, private companies, engage together in order to test some disruptive products or services within a very specific field, such as AI. Why? Because these very specific uh, products or AI applications challenge the, st the regulatory status quo. Therefore, the regulator wants to have a more dynamic approach to regulatory adaptation and the sandbox is the main, uh, let's say, means to uh, this end. It's very interesting uh, that uh, within the AI we have this kind of new uh, pro-innovation and more dynamic uh, approach to, to regulation. We still don't know how uh, is, uh, is it going to play um, uh, out. Still, I think it's a very interesting one. Mm, so this is basically a glimpse of what is the AI Act. Now, what we are currently discussing, uh, because the main or the last uh, proposed draft of the AI Act by the Czech presidency was on the 18th or 19th of October, I think uh, the past 11th of November 2022, also there was a new draft by the Czech presidency with all the new amendments. Now, with all these new amendments, there are some very specific new things, such as not just the regulation of AI systems, but the, the regulation of general purpose AI systems. For instance, large language models or uh, text uh, to image multimodal large models, such as DALI or stable diffusion, we could assume. We could assume. Um, why? Because, in my opinion, also they identified uh, that these systems might uh, be even more uh, difficult from a regulatory uh, perspective to tackle uh, than the others due to their potential. Now it is very interesting because on the one hand uh, they still want to promote this kind of open and pro-innovation approach within the AI field but they are placing more and more restrictions within the AI Act. For instance, uh, as an example, there is a new Article 4 for general purpose AI systems. Within this Article 4, there is 4C, and 4C places an exemption. Let's say uh, an economic stakeholder in the market, a private company, wants to release on an open basis a general purpose AI system, a large language model, for instance. The company is going to be able, if the company 
specifically forbids the use of these systems under the specified high-risk scenarios. So you are already trying to play at the intersection between open releases, as someone could think about open source or broadly open licensing strategies, but at the same time, you are trying to place a set of restrictions based on the enforceable thanks to uh, the AI Act when it comes to general purpose AI systems. And we can already start making this kind of transition towards how all these new provisions might affect uh, open licensing communities or open communities at large, such as the open source communities or companies using, for instance, Creative Commons related licenses or open and responsible AI licenses to release their either pre-trained models or data sets. Right? How this regulatory approach might impact open innovation and collaborative innovation within, for instance, EU, uh, the EU um, framework. I think it's uh, super interesting because at the end of the day, um, what the regulation for the moment being tries uh, to uh, target is an AI system. Now we go back to the, to the definition of an AI system. They take a very holistic approach because from my perspective, an AI system is a machine learning application. So basically a machine learning model embedded within software. However, when we think about pre-trained machine learning models or data sets, these are just components of this AI system and therefore should not be regulated in the same way. For instance, when we release on an open source basis via an open source license, a very permissive one, such as an MIT license or an Apache 2.0 license, a pre-trained model, um, if, for instance, this pre-trained model is a large language model, should uh, it be um, regulated under the AI Act? Should we comply with every single of all uh, the requirements, administrative requirements, to release this specific type of model because this is not an AI system as such. A pre-trained model is just a code repo or sorry, not code repo, a repository with the model file with a bunch and the model at the end of the day, it's a set of weights, parameters, bunch of numbers, if you want to put it this way. It is not a machine learning application. So it is not software embedding uh, this pre-trained model. Now this technical dichotomy or technical difference might also affect the drafting or the thinking of the current draft of the EU AI Act, and I think this is something the European Parliament is already uh, discussing within. Uh, now, when it comes to when they are going to end with, uh, let's say, an agreement or a common approach to how do we tackle or regulate or promote open source or open licensing dynamics within the EU AI Act, I think it is not clear for the moment being. I really don't know whether they will reach an agreement, not just for open source, but uh, for the entire AI Act at the end of December. Um, maybe it would be between February and March due to some of the technical difficulties uh, they are discussing nowadays or they are encountering, not just about open source, but also, for instance, about sandbox. How do you define a sandbox? How do you set the public national infrastructure to run an entire uh, sandbox. These are the things that we still don't know because the AI Act, for instance, when it comes again uh, to sandboxes under Article 53 and 54, uh, they do not specify how these sandboxes are going to work. They specify that the European Commission under implementing acts will issue some type of guidelines in order to take a more operational uh, approach to the sandboxes by national authorities. Right. So this is, let's say, what or the current state of things um, when it comes to the AI Act. Also, I gave you a more specific perspective of my uh, current focus. So regulatory experimentation, open licensing policies and the intersection between those and upcoming regulations such as the AI Act. And we can even broaden a bit uh, the scope uh, to, to close also my, my presentation, thinking about other new regulatory strategies besides the AI Act, almost mirroring some of them, uh, the AI Act, or basically feeling the impact of the Brussels effect, such as uh, Canada's Bill C-27, integrating uh, an AI and Data Act, uh, the UK uh, now issuing some kind of first approach or first policy paper approach 
to the regulation of AI a bit different uh, than the EU uh, AI Act approach, more decentralized and based on every vertical or sectoral agency within the UK. Um, we have also Israel uh, trying to approach now uh, potential AI Act and finally the US Bill of Rights. So a more, let's say, broad, soft, low approach uh, from a US perspective for the moment being uh, to approach this kind of regulation of uh, AI within uh, the US. So that's it. Uh, I hope uh, it was clear enough. And if not, Bart, I'm, uh, I'm ready to discuss with you. Thank you so much, Carlos, for giving us a, a, a brief overview of the AI Act, which is um, a, a, still something that is um, alive and being shaped. Um, as you mentioned as well, this is not the only activity in uh, uh, trying to regulate or trying to um, um, uh, protect citizens or define markets, uh, whatever the main goal is. Um, I'm going to directly dive into um, something that you brought up and um, you mentioned that now in one of the la latest amendments, the EU Council's approach is really to define um, or to start regulating um, so-called general purpose AI. Um, can one define what general purpose AI is? Because that's the first question that I had when I started reading these amendments, uh, because large transformer models or foundation models or whatever you would count are, are not general purpose AI. They are perhaps not domain specific and can handle uh, multiple domains, but where are you going to pull the border? Because sometimes you perhaps um, are developing a, a, a system that can be used later for general or will be part of general purpose AI. <laughs> uh, but like, can you, can you really make a strict line between what is general purpose and what isn't? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think from uh, when you read uh, the current uh, regulatory proposal by the Czech Presidency on general purpose AI systems, it is not clear to me uh, how they define or how they are seeking uh, to approach general purpose AI systems. As you just said, a general purpose AI system maybe doesn't need to be a large language model. It can be just a normal uh, less than 1 billion or 1 billion parameter model, however, accomplishing two or more different uh, functions, text completion to text translation, for instance. Is this a general purpose AI system or is this a multimodal pre-trained model for very specific purposes? And therefore, should we have different categories when it comes to this, to regulate this type of, um, of models? Then for me, I mean, I think the main concern with defining or trying to approach or scope under a regulation, a general purpose AI system is that uh, um, you have some of the components of this system that are going to be regulated. For instance, a pre-trained model, as I was saying. A pre-trained model could be deemed also to be a foundation model, like a large uh, language model. Uh, in any case, this is for the moment being just from a very technical perspective, as I was saying, a large language model, pre-trained one, is just a bunch of numbers. So you have to embed it within software to create this kind of machine learning application so, as the Commission would understand, general purpose AI system, right? So, trying to regulate foundation models or under uh, a definition that scopes far more than a just pre-trained model, so they really miss the technical perspective of technical dichotomy between what's, uh, what are the or which are the AI components, such as a training data set, such as a pre-trained model, and what is an AI system or an AI machine learning product. I think it's crucial. Um, here, I really don't know whether uh, the regulation of general purpose AI systems it's uh, the nice or a sharp approach um, from a regulatory strategy perspective. If they really go for it, um, to be realistic, it might happen if it's already there. It's not just a matter of criticizing, but also about offering solutions. Then I would say if they really go for it to define a general purpose AI system and to have this kind of specific legal regime, so Article 4 for the moment being, they should combine it with a strong uh, strategy on regulatory experimentation. So basically using um, intensively regulatory sandboxes, either at a national level or even creating a harmonized approach to an EU regulatory sandbox for specific uh, critical uh, AI systems. And therefore trying to experiment, but also engaging with the market and even more with associations, uh, with NGOs, about how to approach this regulation 
via this kind of regulatory experimentation approach. Because at the end of the day, a regulatory sandbox is a dynamic interface between, between the public and the private sector. And this is very, very interesting when it comes to this kind of uh, approaches of governing large language models or GPAY, whatever it means, general purpose AI system. Interesting. I, I have the feeling when we start, when we would go in that direction, a lot of researchers publish their papers and then publish their code. Um, 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 that if you start doing this, probably will a lot of researchers will just not publish their code anymore, or will not publish their data sets if that is even allowed, because you are certainly restricted with regulations for making them accessible. As you mentioned, there is. Um, a difference between a pre-deployment of an AI model, which is not an application, and just sharing code. And um, there was this uh, huge discussion about um, Stables Diffusion's the training data set, Lion, which um, was a scraped data set that was not curated and had explicit uh, content in there. And um, I had quite some discussions with people in my field uh, coming from the ethical space. And I asked them, like, how do you know what GPT-3 is trained on, which is the opposite of being an open model because it's closed and nobody had access to the training data set. Um, it's a, an opaque model that is um, supposed to be then ethical. It got scrutinized by uh, testing um, uh, the API service in that sense, but it's not open. And I have this discussion, like if things are really open um, in science, we had the possibility to peer review, to scrutinize it, to adopt it, to optimize it. And that's what science did. Science kind of auto-correct these things and makes it absolutely transparent versus the very close model. Because before um, this summer, we were confronted with like monopolists from OpenAI, which had nothing to do with Open, just their name is Open, but <laughs> they had an Open API. But you didn't have access to any of what uh, uh, the developments they had. And I, and I had huge issues with this. And i give you a, a provocative, provocative example. If you go on DALI from OpenAI and you write there, um, um, create me an image of Prophet Mohammed, it will not uh, create this image. And because there is a restriction in there, because there is an ethical restriction, um, that is already quite difficult because it's um, not within my legal framework that this would not be allowed. And I think this, this discussion from having uh, data sets that are perhaps not perfect, but can be optimized. And there is perhaps a lie on next version. People can use it. I think there are already six research papers being published on Lion that have uh, scrutinized the data set. And I think working on that open part is, from my perspective, if it's pre-deployment, a much faster way to accelerate innovation in a much better way. And I think for Europe, and that's where, where I'm making my point, um, I think Europe doesn't stand a chance if we don't um, uh, create regulations that accelerate collaboration. And I think we have amazing researchers uh, spread across the European Union, but we need to be able to collaborate like you guys did with uh, Big Science and Bloom, which is a perfect example of mass collaboration in the open. And so how what is your take on this like um if you publish a data set for perhaps training a large language model and that data set is scraped and not cleansed and ethical is there even a possibility to create something that is ethical and fits all world models like i i think there is no world cultural or moral model in in that sense if you yeah. if, if start with that point yeah, I think there are two considerations to make there. Um, let me go back to, to to what you just said. I think it's super important to, to make this point uh, out loud um, within the EU. So I think uh, when it comes to the debate of open and close uh, within the EU, uh, we also have to speak about uh, intellectual property policies and the EU traditional approach uh, to intellectual property. I think we have a very conservative approach uh, to intellectual property. So basically intellectual property rights conceived as these exclusion uh, mechanisms for competitive purposes. When you come to open source, open source 
revisits the concept of intellectual property. Open source basically is a tool designed to promote attraction and distribution, not to promote exclusion. Does it mean uh, that open source is just pure altruism? Not at all. I mean, you take a look at the big tech, you take a look at Google, you take a look at Microsoft with GitHub, all of them master the open source commercial business. I mean, take a look at the most used or one of the most used uh, machine learning frameworks nowadays. It's TensorFlow from Google, and it's on an Apache 2.0 basis. The problem within Europe, or the, our main challenge, is that from an IP policy perspective, we don't know how to compete within open source markets because we do not want to release our tools. We are not used to release our IP like this. I mean, we are having nowadays even the same debate within the telecoms sector, within standardization and 5G. Why? Because we have, first of all, proponents of standard essential patents seeking to extract direct revenues from the uh, monetization of, of these patents and then pro-open source um, stakeholders trying to get their feet on and collaborate within these more traditional scenarios. But coming back uh, to the AI uh, field, I think this is one of the major uh, pain points when it comes to IP policy within the EU. I think the EU should invest more on an open source strategic approach uh, or an open innovation approach within the EU and more specifically uh, for AI. Um, plus, also, I think you, they should strike this kind of balance or take this approach within uh, the AI Act. The AI Act should reflect really uh, this willingness to go or to compete on an open source uh, basis. Uh, with regards uh, open data sets and uh, ethical uh, related challenges, as as you were naming, yes, I think it's something that um, it's a really interesting approach that we, for instance, we took at Big Science and we also uh, take at Hugging Phase. We are already taking it right now at Big Code. We can later on speak about uh, Big Code, which is when you open something, either a data set, training data set or pre-trained model, it's fine. I mean, you are not losing market because you take a more open and collaborative approach to the development or even enhancement, modification, performance of your pre-trained model that later on, downstream in the value chain, you are going to embed within your machine learning related application. And this is what you are going to license, sell or commercialize, but not the top value stream, not pre-trained models or training data sets. There is where the open and collaborative innovation approach can work at its best. And it's working. I mean, we are, we are seeing it with big science, a big science uh, to develop an open, and transparent large language model, we were more than 1,200 researchers on a Slack channel. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we show the world that uh, not just big tech uh, can uh, take this kind of close approach to the development of large language model, everyone can, can do it. Um, it's a matter of showing them how. Then uh, we have also a new approach um, to open and collaborative machine learning, which is the one of Big Code. I don't know if you have specific questions or I can go with uh, the context of Big Code right now. You, you, you can uh, yeah. go, go ahead on Big Code. We can perhaps uh, later yeah. on, but like, um, I like the flow of, 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 your, of, of your... Cool. Yeah, your... So, so now with Big Code, it's very interesting uh, because... Um, Bcode could be um, defined as an extension or a next step stemming from uh, big science. Bcode, of course, uh, to be transparent, is a collaboration uh, between Hugging Face and uh, ServiceNow, uh, where we set an open and collaborative approach to the development of a large language model trained for code generation. Okay. Uh, you, we, are, or, we, are, we are confronted with a healthcare audience and and you are talking about software code generation. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. Software, thanks. Thanks for the specificity. <laughs> yeah, software uh, code generation. I think within the Slack channel, we are nowadays more than uh, or almost 400 uh, researchers within. And we are taking the same approach as we took uh, for Big Science. So an open approach, uh, not just to open sourcing the result of it, but also an open and transparent approach to the entire development process, to the entire innovation process, not just of the large language model, but also, and more importantly, on the training data set. Because what we are willing to release is not just the large language model, but also the training data set. More importantly, what we first released was the training data set, the first version, the V1.0 of the stack. So the stack initially was a, th a three terabyte data set 
basically uh, made of uh, publicly released source code, right? Source code, source code repositories. Now, the approach uh, we decided to take uh, for uh, the stack was a very transparent one. I think we wanted really uh, for the public to conceive uh, the stack, so this training data set, as the governance interface between the AI community and the open source or software uh, developers community. Why? Because we wanted also to give uh, the software developers the tools, the means to uh, take out their code from the training data set if they weren't or they didn't want to consent uh, that the, their code was used as training uh, data within the data set. So we created a specific uh, form that uh, co-developers can fill out if they spot their code within uh, the training data set. Now you might ask, yeah, but... Carlos, I'm going to stop you there because it's a really extremely interesting point you made with the opt-out. Because if you detect as a coder that your code has been used and you share it and you want to opt out, which is something you could call dynamic consent, uh, we call it in, in, in medi medical spheres, uh, but the model already has been trained on your code. Are you going to then unlearn the model? Because there was a case um, in the in the US from the Trade Commission where um, um, a company was obliged, based on such a case, that they had to unlearn their model, which in theory is quite difficult because then you need to um, uh, probably um, um, uh, delete all the transactions being made with the model to make it auditable and correct but how do you deal with this? Like if you opt out and the, the, the knowledge of your data is already actually embedded within that model in the weights files, um, and what does it mean opt out when the, can you really opt out? Yeah, exactly. So I think what uh, the approach we are taking, it's a procedural one. So basically um, we do not still have any train models that we are going to release. Um, and this is going to take some months. So for instance, if now we decided to go with the version of the training data set we have um, and we start training the model and we train the model and if during this process, as you just mentioned, some other uh, developers say, hey, but I want also my code to be uh, taken out uh, and we are already training and we already train. Now the thing uh, that we plan to do is not just to release uh, maybe one uh, version of uh, big code, Maybe we will train one or two uh, smaller versions first, and then maybe we will train another uh, big one. So also we are going to give uh, software developers sufficient a sufficient amount of time uh, to really uh, trying to manifest uh, their concerns or even opting out. The other thing that is also very important to take into account for your challenge, because of course it's a challenge, it might happen that we end up having or releasing, uh, yeah, we, it might happen that uh, we end up uh, releasing big code and still uh, maybe some code developers still want or just have realized uh, once uh, big code is released that they want uh, their, uh, their code to be uh, taken out. I think also a very important or another uh, tooling that we are working on is on the output phase of uh, the large language model. When the model uh, directly outputs an entire uh, code repository, Okay, it, it could happen. Now what we are working is on specific tooling that when this happens, uh, the user knows the source of uh, this code repository. So basically the user knows the license, the user knows the author attribution for it to respect it. What we are working on right now, which is very, it's more difficult or more specific, it's on um, working on these specific identification techniques um, or tracking techniques to be, to be able to comply with the open source uh, license or attributions uh, requirements for code snippets. So not when the model output the entire code repo, but when the model will output maybe specific uh, lines of codes. So not the entire repo. Even in if this case that you as a user could be able uh, to track uh, the origin of uh, this specific source code because it's potentially subject to um, copyright protection, and there are no open source license, and even if it is permissive, the permissive license doesn't mean that there are no uh, requirements within the license. A permissive license means that you have to give attribution, you have to give uh, license notices, for instance, all these are requirements, maybe not as hard or as restrictive as a copyleft traditional requirement, but still these are licensing uh, requirements. And this is something that we are currently working on. 
amazing, uh, uh, quite challenging as well, because like one question that I would have is there was, um, as you know, this uh, class action lawsuit now against Microsoft and GitHub, uh, because they um, used uh, permissive licenses by attribution licenses. And then there were a number of cases of tweets where people discovered their code. Um, and how do you then avoid when you publish now the, um, um, the data set itself that um, a company like GitHub from Microsoft uses that data set and doesn't comply with all the uh, controls that you and the functions that you just mentioned before, where you can explain and go back to the original code. Uh, how do you avoid um, that by creating open data sets, you even increase asymmetries and they don't have to share back? Like, how, how do you deal with this? So I think um, we we cannot uh, also we cannot anticipate what other companies might or might not do uh, with the with the data set. I think what we are trying to create also with the data set, with the training data set, as I was mentioning, is kind of open governance interface. It's also this kind of experimental governance approach between the AI community and their software developers or open source communities. There are some things that maybe the law uh, is not fit nowadays to fix. And therefore, we as an open uh, community have to approach other different communities and work together. Because, of course, on the other hand, you have a lot of software developers that appreciate and uh, would use uh, this specific tooling, right? So they would use, uh, for instance, ML apps uh, specifically devoted for, uh, devoted, sorry, to uh, code generation or helping them to uh, generate code. Therefore, they are also uh, interested. It's a matter of seeing how do we collaborate and we approach governance on a different manner, not turning the back to each other and criticizing, right? Yeah, what, what I actually mentioned it, like there was this critic on open source that like it's called the open paradox that uh, open source was actually meant to break down monopolies 20 years ago with the monopoly of Microsoft and then the Apache and Linux Foundation came in. It was always about fighting a bit like against the concentration of power. As you just mentioned with big science, there was a collaboration of 1,200 scientists. So not only a corporate structure can let people organize in a way that they collaborate, uh, and this is quite promising, but at the same time, it also was criticized that if you then share open that others who actually don't contribute just take. And you can simulate this using the game theory and the prison dilemma. I don't know, for the people looking, uh, the prison dilemma is when uh, you both, like with, with your friend, you uh, plan a crime um, and you both get caught and you're in, both in separate rooms in jail. And if you didn't make agreements what you were going to say to the police and one says like, well, I'm going to confess everything, he's going to get a better outcome uh, because he's making a deal. Um, and so there are four scenarios that one makes the deal, the other one makes the deal. Both don't say anything or the both speak. And it's always in the prison dilemma that when both make an agreement that this is the best outcome. Now, when we talk about data spaces um, in, in Europe and, and data, there was also this mention that within the data space, we have a joint agreement of the usage. But if you now connect this to AI and then, for example, a big tech company goes in that data space with the already closed pre tained model, and then access that data space, are you not then just doing exactly the same as the open paradox? Because then they have access to the data, but they are not mandatory, mandated to give back and share back of that, what they already have. Yeah, I understand. I think it's a, it's a very... <laughs> It's a very tricky challenge because there you are, of course, uh, entering into the field of uh, competition dynamics in AI, in AI specific uh, markets. I mean, for maybe to change the paradigm, you also have to propose or to design new types of licensing paradigms. Maybe you are interested in creating an open source approach to data, so open data, there are already, uh, since some years now, uh, some open uh, data license templates al already there. Uh, maybe uh, to approach data licensing from a copyleft approach, how copyleft would play its role within data, uh, within data license, how you could you, as the licensor, 
enforce uh, copyleft provisions within uh, within data. I think something that we are currently thinking on also uh, about uh, data licensing or data set licensing is to include specific provisions such as copyleft related ones but for the sake of transparency. It's fine that you use uh, the data set, it's fine that you redistribute uh, the data set if you want However, you are going, if you distribute or redistribute the data set, you are going to have to comply with some specific transparency requirements. For instance, having a data card or a data sheet, um, bringing public some of the technical specifications of the data set or modifications that you made uh, to the data set. Also to be able for the others, for the public at large, to be in compliance with the EA Act, right? Um, so all these things, basically tracking the source of uh, modifications of the data set, uh, but at the same time, um, promoting some kind of diligent uh, practices in terms of transparency when releasing data sets, documentation of data sets, but also of models, is something that we are currently thinking on from a licensing perspective. So how could we use license or whether we can uh, use licenses for these specific purposes because maybe regulation is not enough. We have been thinking about this as well with the Hippo Eye Foundation. Wanted to as a project name the Hippo Eye License, with because the the thing is when I give consent for using my patient data, I want to give consent for an open world. Like I don't want others to take the data, and out of these data extractions create IP that when I'm sick, out of something that normally would cost ten euros, I pay four thousand euros because somebody has the cap capability to create something that is suddenly scarce. Um, um, and that's the model what pharma has been using, what some medical and biotech have been using. But I think we could um, um, ask patients, what do you want? Like, is it, do you want a restrictive license, an open license? And um, uh, we also discovered that at the moment there is, we have another debate on our, or had another debate uh, in our conference on this, on this topic, that we, we probably will need new licenses. But then, Coming now back to the EU regulations and the Data Act and the AI Act, and I talked to Paul Nemitz about this. Um, <laughs> these teams don't even communicate with each other. Like these were different teams that were defining the regulations, and um, I, I find this so absurd that the European Union is now creating these uh, regulations, but then these these things are not interconnected, and they should be interconnected. Do you see? Uh, because you, you always said, like, we're trying to find solutions, I'm trying to find solutions. Do you see that the European Union is trying to find solutions within the Data Act that would solve that problem? Yeah, I think that that, <laughs> that, that act could be perfectly the subject of an hour, uh, of another hour discussion, and I'm sure you're already going to have this discussion with other uh, panelists. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's super interesting to think from, a, or again, from a policy strategy perspective, about um, a potential articulation between the Data Act and the AA Act. For instance, you go to Article 10 of the AA Act and you have Article 10 is specifically devoted to data set governance, to data set documentation, compliance requirements, and Article 11 to technical specification and documentation, not just of the data set, but also of the pre-trained model. So you have already some kind of data governance and quality expectations stemming from the A Act, so a sexual regulation. And then you go to the Data Act, another sexual regulation, also willing to promote this kind of new open uh, approach to uh, data sharing with specific mandatory requirements with a very specific hardware uh, focus. So I really don't know how uh, the Data Act would play in, uh, in cloud uh, generating ML systems, for instance, generating data, but instead for IoT devices, it, it, it was specifically designed for IoT devices, how these kind of uh, mandatory requirements to share uh, this data on either open licenses or front terms, also very uncertain, but still, how these mandatory requirements could play or could articulate with uh, the quality and governance also mandatory requirements stemming from uh, the AI Act. We don't know. Should it be maybe via a specific set of guidelines uh, promoted or drafted by the Commission in the near term? I assume. Or this is I guess, uh, this is my guess. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I agree with with everything you said. Like there was one point that I also wanted to ask you, like the GDPR right to be forgotten and um, trained AI models. Um, is that something we need to forget? Like because once you have, um, um, if you have the right to be forgotten and your the model is trained on your data, um, 
you're not forgotten. <laughs> Even if you pull back your data, um, how do you look at this? Like, um, it's, yeah, it's a I, yeah, I think, uh, so first of all, uh, you, of course, you as an individual would have to know that uh, your uh, personal uh, information or PII uh, is within uh, the data set. Uh, second of all, yeah, about the right to be forgotten or also uh, interacting with the notion of consent uh, under GDPR, I think. Uh, or even uh, the legitimate the the use of the data or processing of the data for legitimate uh, purposes. I think this is something, for instance, within uh, big science and big code that we are approaching. Uh, I can give you the example of PAI identification within big code, uh, within the training data set. The training data set, of course, are code repositories, but within source code repositories, you might have the name of uh, of mm -hmm. the author. Right, and for instance, this name of the author might also intersect with uh, the attribution requirement of the open source license. So, you have you give attribution to the author, right? But this is another discussion. In any case, sure. you might have or find the name of the author or just an email address to contact the author in their GitHub rep, right? Something like this. These are uh, personal identified data that you have to remove, and you do it by either uh, filtering techniques within the data set or even filtering techniques once the data set is, or the model, sorry, once the pre-trained model is outputting something. So in the output phase, for instance, within big science, I remember when we were, when, when we, yeah, when we trained uh, Bloom, uh, every single time Bloom uh, could output uh, a Gmail address, instead of saying uh, Carlos uh, Muñoz Ferrandis uh, living in street and with uh, Gmail address. Instead of my email address, you play some kind of synthetic uh, data replacement. Instead of my specific Gmail address, you just put Gmail or email address, right? So you start trying to filtering out these very specific sensitive informations also in the output phase. So you have always to have this kind of two dimensions when you approach uh, the governance of a model. You have the training phase and you have the output phase and you have also two different opportunities to govern uh, the, yeah, the development of, of AI in this case. So training and output. Um, thank you. I, I'm not going to go in, into that because it would open a, a new dimension, but um, okay. <laughs> in, in my field, we talk about um, genetic data, which is also a language <laughs> existing out of four letters. Uh, and that's going to be much more challenging as putting your name of the author because it's my personal genome that I share. And and then training, uh, you use these people use these large language models as well to apply them on, on on sequence data. And then having that same discussion on sequence data and then pulling back your data is going to be uh, for me a, a quite big challenge uh, because it's it's it is much more uh, difficult to. Um, um, understand like this snippet of, of my sequence data is, is, is that what is mine and I have to pull it back. It's, it is uh, much more difficult as what you're doing with BigCode. I, I want to switch a bit like another thing that I always confronted and I know if you are confronted against open source. Um, it's the bad actor argument. <laughs> and the bad actor argument is um, I think thousand years old. It's about People owning power and then fighting against the democratization of that power. And um, going back to Gutenberg, I um, found this text, which I, when I was reading it, it was a deja vu that I had because um, Gutenberg wrote that his goal was that every man and woman had to be literate and it has to be as cheap. So a peasant would be able to read books. And then uh, the, in that conversation, the monk said like, but what about the dangers? Because it's like if you give books to people and the ability to print a book, it's like giving a candle to an infant. And when I had discussions on open source and somebody said recently, and a, a researcher that I respect a lot, which is working on privacy, Carissa Felitz from Oxford, um, she said like uh, that code sharing sounds warm and fuzzy, but then if you give everybody access to the code, they can also manipulate it for their own aims, and this includes bad actors. So, and so this is being used as an argument against opening up. What what is your position on this? Yeah, I think so. There is no just one way to openly release the AI models. I think uh, first of all, um, when we refer to open source, uh, people have very 
different conceptions or understandings of what is open source. For instance, for me, open source is open source as held by the open source initiative and the open source definition principles. But for instance, other people, when they think about Creative Commons or just another open license, they just name open source. I'm open sourcing my model. I'm open sourcing my data set. So that's, 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 point. that's one point, right? How or what do we understand uh, open source? The second point is whether I can openly uh, release something and at the same time expect some kind of uh, behavior from uh, the licensees, right? Um, in this case, you can openly release something, but at the same time, place some kind of use restrictions. Because, for instance, you know that your pre-trained model was not specifically to train for uh, medical uh, medical results interpretation. Well, play this restriction, but still you are allowing a commercial use and an open use of your model. That's fine. Then it is for you as licensor uh, to see how do you enforce um, the license, right? And this is something that you are going to see more and more when the AI Act is going to enter into force. We already discussed general purpose AI systems under Article 4C and this exception of the Czech presidency. Of course, you can release and you com can commercialize them. However, please make explicit that you or the user cannot use the AI system for every single high-risk purpose. So therefore, you have to create some kind of new open licensing paradigm, not open source according to the open source definition, in order for promoting, first of all, an open release of your tool, and second of all, a set of use restrictions. It is not a matter of taking this kind of binary approach that open is bad and close is good. Um, it won't help at all. It is a matter of finding these kind of solutions uh, targeting to strike a balance between open innovation and responsible uh, innovation. Okay, um, super interesting. I even think my argument is that bad actors are everywhere. Like even in Twitter, there were employees that were sharing uh, information through the secret service in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, bad actors were in Stuxnet, which was a closed model and, and, and it was a, a warm. Like bad actors is not, uh, it's, it's a false correlation to say that this is, because it's open source, you will see more bad actors playing with it. Uh, bad actors are everywhere. They are in closed organizations. They are in, um, in the open in that sense. And, and one point what I want to make out is if, if, if you want to have closed models and the regulations, like how do we going to, how do reg regulatory bodies or the, the, um, the ones that certify AI, how are they going to even be able to control um, and, 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 and look at the, not only the ethical perspective, but the regulatory perspective? Because in, in medicine, we have now just this new, medical device regulation, which is so complex that we lack now medical devices because we lack consultants to certify on the market in Europe to certify these devices on the new MDR regulation. There is a backlog of one year um, because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the experts uh, to even regulate life-saving medical devices. How the hell are we going to deal this with AI when there is, when we're going to regulate this from? Who is going to do this? Where are we going to get the experts from? Yeah, so I think this is uh, exactly uh, the same challenge as it is uh, happening right now uh, or being discussed right now under the AI Act. Uh, where are these machine learning or AI experts that are going to work as public servants within uh, the AI National Authority or within notified authorities? Do we have a technical... Uh, notified authorities ready uh, to assess under a technical expertise approach uh, AI applications and services? I think we don't for the moment being. Now, how uh, is this uh, going to play out in the short run, maybe the first year after the AI Act is going to enter into force? I think there, there are two things or potentially one main thing uh, that I forgot to, to mention when I, was, uh, when I was explaining or introducing the AI Act. It's also Article 40 and Article 41, basically standards and technical specifications. So the reliance from the European Commission or the AI Act on standardization. Because if you are compliant with an AI standard, it could be assumed or it is uh, stated that if you are compliant with the AI standard, you are compliant with the AI Act. So you establish some kind of new self-auditing process for economic uh, actors in the market. 
for them to comply with AI standards. Therefore, as a company, if I comply with the AI standard, I comply with the AI Act and afterwards, potentially, it is uh, the burden of the AI National Authority to uh, scrutinize my practices and open a case, for instance, against me or my behaviors. In any case, I think this is for the moment being the way it has been approached. And we can also, and I, I'm not going to enter now into the debate, we could even approach how uh, these AI standards are being developed. What is a trustworthy AI standard? How do you define trustworthiness? At the end of the day, you are going to end up with a 200 pages technical specification specifying what is trustworthiness. But the more important thing is not what is, is how to implement the standard in the market. How am I compliant with the market? Which specific software tools uh, do I have to develop to be compliant with the standard? Are notified bodies slash um, consulting firms going to provide this kind of new market of software compliance tools for a standards or the AI Act? Should we develop some kind of new set of uh, standard implementation on an open source basis for everyone to benefit uh, out and be able to be compliant with the AI Act? Should the European Commission promote or even finance this kind of new open source related tooling? Are the European uh, standardization organizations being or the ones competent in developing not technical specifications but software reference implementations, which is something very different to their uh, traditional role? All these questions are open for debate for the moment being. Quite a lot of uh, work still to do and um, um, and more challenges than, than solutions at the moment, I see. Um, and I'm a bit afraid that um, that we uh, kind of still, um, we don't, it, it is like a waterfall model in that what we're doing in the regulation. Uh, we, we should perhaps go and start with small bits and then um, at, at the same time uh, update these regulations. But because we, we there is so much complexity between the different acts and then the different industries and the different regulations within the industries that I see this as extremely challenging. And I, for me, the, the most competitive thing we can do in Europe is really force open source standards uh, because it will free up resources. Even in the, in the, the scrutinization, as I mentioned before, there will be uh, some sort of auto regulation because of the openness uh, and because of the, peer reviewing and the scrutiny that, that can be, um, uh, that we always did in science. Like if you publish the paper, others could like try to replicate your, science, your scientific outcomes and could challenge uh, that what you published is, is actually a bogus science. Um, that was always how we corrected it. And I find it really strange that we now try to frame this all into rules. Um, and, and I see it as a bit uh, too restrictive and it could lead that at the end, only large organizations uh, will have the competitive advantage uh, to move forward because they have the resources to do so. And that is, I think, the biggest danger if you over-regulate that small and medium enterprises um, uh, won't be part of this. So. But um, I have thousands of questions I could go on for an hour, but in sake of time, we um, have to unfortunately close this extremely exciting conversation. Um, I'm looking really forward to see your work with BigCode. I'm so thankful that you were part of Big Science. I think Big Science and Bloom uh, is a, a first an open AI monopoly killer. And it showed uh, a trajectory uh, because it didn't only open source the source code, but also the methods and the governance models for the data. And I think making that available so people can replicate these kind of collaborations is the way to go forward. And, um, and I think I mentioned in my newsletter, Bloom is one of the most, being the most uh, important uh, model of this decade um, because it's it it is such a guide like guidance for how we can how we can collaborate as humans as organizations just for the purpose of creating a decentralized power and and giving that power to small and medium enterprise to everyone um, I think uh, it's it, it's very similar to the printing press and the, the every democratization discussion we ever had like the internet all these things that empowered people and advanced society. So thank you so much for doing that work and I'm looking forward to read more about it and to see it. So uh, Carlos, um, wish you all the best in your future endeavors. If you want to add a few lines, then uh, we can have to close the session. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you so much uh, to you and, and uh, to Hippo uh, in, in general uh, for, for the kind invitation. And I think this is a debate that we should have uh, even on a weekly basis. We have really 
uh, this kind of duty to promote uh, open and collaborative innovation or open source related one uh, within the EU. Uh, we are going to benefit from it, specifically on AI related markets. So yeah, this is definitely the way. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bart. Thank you, Carlos.